Mubarak says he'll quit as Egypt's president, but not till September. This is the ITV News at 5.30 with Sangeeta Kandola. Faced with massive popular protests, Mr Mubarak says he'll stand down this autumn after 30 years in power. Also on the programme this morning. Unrest on the streets spreads to another pro-Western country, Jordan. And how to visit the world's best art galleries without leaving your home. Good morning and welcome to the programme. After eight days of nationwide protests, Egypt's President Mubarak has said he will stand down at next September's election after 30 years in power. In a televised speech, he also said his son would not be a candidate to succeed him. America and Britain have pressed strongly for a peaceful end to the crisis, but it's not clear if the hundreds of thousands of demonstrators who want Mr Mubarak to go at once will wait till September. Our first report is from our Middle East correspondent, John Ray. It has taken them just seven days to unravel a regime three decades old. As they celebrated in Liberation Square tonight, on state TV, Hosni Mubarak bowed to the inevitable. But even now he wants to go on terms his own, not straight away, but elections due in the autumn. From the blackened hulk of his ruling party's headquarters, it had been but a short distance to the vibrant masses in Liberty Square. And what a contrast. For 30 years, they dare not criticize their president. Now they hang his effigy. This is what revolution looks like. It is simply breathtaking. I was here a week ago and this square was empty, ringed only by riot police. But just look at it now. A sea of faces, an ocean of expectation. We are here with the protesters all have the same world. Go away. It wasn't just Cairo, but countrywide. In Alexandria, another 100,000 or more were on the march. They might not have made the million mark, but to them it doesn't seem to matter. These are new Egyptians. Uh, the, the first time they have confidence, they have hope, they have dignity. Uh, uh, they feel that they have been reborn from being, from being slaves into human beings. State TV broadcast the demonstrations but urged people to stay away for their own safety. The United Nations puts the death toll from these past few days at 300. But we found one protest where the tears were shed for the president. They kissed his picture and proclaimed him their protector, Egypt's strongman. But mostly they fear what will come next. They have just one aim, a state Mubarak's bliss. No other aim for this. The end can't come soon enough for the crowds. But the post Mubarak era is in sight. Egypt's future begins now. John Ray, ITV News, Cairo. So, how has Mr Mubarak's plan to stand down this autumn gone down with the protesters in Cairo who want him to leave at once? Our international editor, John Irvine, joined them to find out. They are a people who feel forgotten and ignored by their leader, but they know these last eight days and nights have got his attention, and the expectation was palpable when he appeared on a makeshift TV screen in uprising central Tahrir Square. However, in the end, they were disappointed. It was a resignation in all but name, but a post-dated one, and therefore not enough. Sir, can I ask you for your reaction? People here are not going to leave until he leaves. Um, he, he's taking steps, forward steps in, for more democracy. Uh, this, is, this is definitely good, but at this point, it will not do anything good to these people. These people want him out. So a post well, We are seeing right now the same scenario happened in Tunisia. Right now, he said the same speech Ben Ali said a few weeks ago. People want him out. He could just soft and silk, just move the power to uh, to Omar Suleiman and, and 
and everything's going to be all right. I don't want him. I don't trust him. This movement is only a few days old, and yet they're incredibly impatient. But perhaps nobody should blame them after what they regard as 30 wasted years. So the uprising will continue and maintain its purity of purpose to bring about the immediate resignation of President Mubarak. John Irvine, ITV News, Cairo. The Foreign Office is to charter its own flight to ensure Britons are not left stranded in Egypt. British passengers are waiting at Cairo Airport for the Boeing 757, which will fly out to collect them later today. It could be followed by further trips, but the government says most people wanting to leave should be able to use commercial flights. The current turmoil across the Middle East is now affecting another Arab state, Jordan. In the face of protests on the street, Jordan's King Abdullah has sacked his prime minister and appointed a new leader. Demonstrators are angry at the lack of jobs and say they want more democracy. America is watching the spreading unrest in the Arab world with great anxiety in case more pro-Western leaders in the region come under pressure to step down. This was the reaction from President Obama last night to the news of a change of leadership in Cairo. Now, it is not the role of any other country to determine Egypt's leaders. Only the Egyptian people can do that. What is clear, and what I indicated tonight to President Mubarak, is my belief that an orderly transition must be meaningful, it must be peaceful, and it must begin now. Furthermore, the process must include a broad spectrum of Egyptian voices and opposition parties. It should lead to elections that are free and fair. And it should result in a government that's not only grounded in democratic principles, but is also responsive to the aspirations of the Egyptian people. Well, America's greatest fear about the Arab world is that a change of regime could produce another Iran, where the pro-Western Shah was overthrown by the hardline Ayatollahs who still hold power in Tehran. Our Washington correspondent Robert Moore looks at what America's done to stop that happening again. I think there is mounting evidence about the role that Washington played uh, in the events that unfolded uh, yesterday evening in Cairo with the Mubarak speech. We know, for example, that yesterday Robert Gates, the U.S. Defense Secretary, spoke uh, to his Egyptian counterpart. We know that the seasoned U.S. diplomat uh, Frank Visner, who uh, essentially is an Obama envoy, met with President Mubarak and took a message directly from the White House with him, essentially saying, President Mubarak, you have to go, and you have to go sooner rather than later. So lots of evidence there that the U.S. has significantly shifted its position. Uh, look, there were no good options probably for the United States in the events that unfolded. This was a powerful ally being lost, uh, potentially, but this was perhaps the option that the United States wanted to see, what earlier in the week they called the orderly transition. Uh, more importantly, I think, for the United States, they know this has regional implications. This is a, a template for change, not just for Egypt, but for Saudi Arabia, for Jordan and for Syria. This is going to be a test for whether uh, Middle East autocrats can hand power uh, peacefully to the people without that process being hijacked by militants or by the military. Our Washington correspondent Robert Moore with that assessment. And now other news. Computer technicians have managed to repair the new police website showing the crime rate in every neighbourhood in England and Wales. It crashed yesterday when more than 4 million people tried to log on to it during one 60-minute period. The site's meant to help the public hold the police to account. But what do people think if they live in a street that's singled out as a crime black spot? Helen Callaghan went to Swansea to find out. The majestic sweep of Swansea Bay looks idyllic, yet one street in the middle of this city is, according to the government's new website, one of the worst crime hotspots in England and Wales. Wine Street in the city centre is well known for its bars, clubs and restaurants. But what the people who live and work here don't want is for it to become well known as a trouble spot. The No Sign Bar has been here in some form for hundreds of years. Owner Mark Hartson says having the street judged by statistics alone is misleading and unhelpful. 
that's going to be bad for, for tourism for us as a tourist a tourist destination. I think it's bad for us as for bars and pubs. I think it's, it's, it's half glorifying it really, isn't it? And I think it's unjustified. The government hopes the newly launched Home Office website will allow us to find out what's happening on our street. It crashed when four million of us logged on in an hour. But high demand does suggest many like the idea. Now I know that a lot of crime goes on, maybe I'll be more careful when I come here next time. 148 incidents on Wine Street were reported to the police in December. But everyone we spoke to pointed out where there are lots of people and lots of police, figures will be higher. I don't think this is a helpful way to deal with crime figures. The police surely know the crime hotspots in their areas. For residents like Joanne Bevan, at best, this is an expensive way to tell people what they already know. Helen Callahan, ITV News, Swansea. The public's concern about the weakness of the economy has been highlighted in the latest viewers survey for ITV News. Our regular comrades poll suggests that half the country think that Britain is heading back into recession, the so-called double dip. And almost as many of those questioned think the government don't know how to stop it happening. Our senior correspondent James Mates has the details. There'll be no change of course on the economy, say both the Prime Minister and the Chancellor, but they both sound as if they're under pressure, and recent figures show why. Inflation and unemployment up, economic growth down. And our regular cuts index polling suggests that many of you are beginning to lose confidence, both in our leaders and their strategy. First and most importantly, do we trust these politicians to see us through the current economic situation? George Osborne, the Chancellor, just 22% say yes, they do. David Cameron, he does better on 33%, but it's hardly stellar. And his Deputy Prime Minister, Nick Clegg, well, he's down there with George Osborne, barely one in five saying, yes, we trust him. As to the economy, has the government lost control? Well, look, almost half of you here say, yes, it has, compared to just 29%, and that's fewer than one in three, who believe they are still on top of things. The public are, are, are not stupid. They see what's going on in economies like America, which saw uh, some pretty healthy growth at the end of last year, compared with what's going on in this country. And they question then the government's reassurances that everything is, is under control, when clearly some of the news coming uh, from the economy lately has taken the government by surprise as well. And where are we heading? To recovery? or to another recession. Are we heading, we ask, for that dreaded double dip? Well, more than half of you now think, yes, we are. And look how that line has been rising since we started asking this question back in October. The numbers who think the economy will be OK, well, that is plummeting here, now down to just 17%. More generally, are things heading in the right direction? Again, our two lines are heading in opposite directions. Those who think things are going well, well, that is slipping down to just 28% of you now, compared to those who think, nope, it's all going wrong, look at that, up to almost half, 48%. David Cameron concedes that 2011 will be a difficult and painful year. There's every reason to think that things will continue to get worse before they get better. He's optimistic. It's clear from our Cuts Index polling that fewer and fewer of the rest of you are convinced. Our senior correspondent, James Mates, with that report. The American drug firm Pfizer is to close its research centre at Sandwich in Kent. The plant is where scientists developed Viagra, about 2,400 jobs are now at risk. A time for a first look at this morning's front pages, starting then with The Independent, which pictures a striking image just showing part of the massive crowd that gathered in Cairo. Just above the headline, a million demand change. On to the Times now, and more protesters pictured on their front page. The headline, Mubarak's long goodbye, reporting on news, of course, that Egypt's president announced he would not seek a sixth term in September's election. Well, he also pictured on the front page of The Guardian this morning. Uh, the headline here, power to the people, Mubarak finally bows to the inevitable after 30 years in power. Well, that same story also makes the front page of the Financial Times this morning. Their main story, though, reports that the American drug company Pfizer is closing its flagship research centre in the UK with a loss of 2,400 jobs. The mirror this morning shows the kitchen in a flat in Leeds where the bombs for the 7-7 attacks were made. The photos were shown at the inquest into the deaths of the victims. 
The paper describes the scene as Hell's Kitchen. On to the Telegraph now. The 9-11 gang that got away is the headline there, reporting that the FBI has launched a manhunt for a previously unknown team of men suspected of being part of the September 11 attacks. And a look at the Express now. It says airlines are being urged to introduce adult-only flights. That after a survey found that noisy children were many passengers' pet hate. They are your morning's papers. BP and its shareholders have paid the financial price for last year's oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico. For the first time in nearly two decades, the huge company made a loss. BP was in the red by more than £3 billion last year. It will still pay a dividend. That's good news for Britain's pension funds, but it will only be half the size of last year's. Our economics editor, Daisy McAndrew, reports. As corporate disasters go, they don't get much worse. What started as a tragedy last April, taking 11 lives and numerous livelihoods, not to mention untold environmental damage, became a PR disaster when the damage limitation made matters even worse. And I'd like my life back. So there's no one who wants this thing done more than I do. No surprise that the figures don't make for happy reading. BP posted their worst results in 20 years. A lot of people were badly shaken by the events of last year and looking for the company to demonstrate in the course of 2011 that they have learnt the lessons and moved on to rebuild confidence in investors and frankly to rebuild the business. BP reported more than £3 billion of losses, the first time they've been in the red for nearly two decades. This time last year they posted profits of £8.7 billion. But they are paying quarterly dividend payments at 4.3 pence, which is good news for pension holders and investors as pre-spill BP counted for an estimated £1 in every six of UK dividends. BP was the country's largest dividend payer until the middle of last year when they cancelled all payments. They are resuming as of now, but only at about half the level they used to pay. So what of the future? Well, given there's little love lost for BP in the States, it's not surprising it's halving its refining capacity there and instead has been busy getting in bed with Russians. Trouble is, it's been rather promiscuous and has upset its original Russian partners, AAR, by taking up with state-controlled oil company Rosneft. And the oligarchs tonight won a court injunction blocking the deal for now. There's still a huge amount of uncertainty around the company. Um, quite clearly, the, the Russian projects aren't going according to plan. Uh, there's still the ongoing situation in the states of the cleanup process and various litigation that hasn't even really started. The new chief executive, Bob Dudley, says he's on a journey to re-establish trust in BP around the world. He's got his work cut out. Daisy McAndrew, ITV News. The government is putting an extra £400 million into England's mental health services to putting them on an equal footing with physical health. The plan will be unveiled later by the Deputy Prime Minister Nick Clegg. He'll also stress the need for earlier treatment of mental illness among young people. But Labour say the plans are far from clear. And one charity complained that NHS facilities are actually being cut. Yao Chin has the details. I feel completely hopeless, um, I've had suicidal thoughts, I've had two suicide attempts um, and yeah I can just envisage that happening for the rest of my life if I don't get the help that I need. Life started to become particularly difficult for Jessica when she was taking her GCSEs, buffeted through cycles of depression, spells of overactive sleeplessness and then periods of normality. She has since been diagnosed with bipolar disorder. Nobody wanted to help me and they didn't seem to recognise this as a young girl. She's at university trying to make something of her life. I could slip through the net, end up so severely depressed that I'm unable to get up and go to work. Mental illness can affect everyone, but as in Jessica's case, it often takes root in children as they journey to adulthood. Government figures suggest that half of those with lifetime mental health problems first experience symptoms before the age of 14 and three quarters before their mid-twenties. Today, the government will embrace a positive attitude to mental health. Beyond combating the associated stigma, there will be a focus on awareness both for the patient and for healthcare providers of the value of talking therapies. This kind of treatment has had much success at this specialist children's centre. The government hopes this will be just what the doctor will order. 
Well, we're now providing extra money, £400 million extra money, which should allow over a million, 1.2 million more people to have access to uh, talking therapies. And that in itself should, should get several thousand more people back into, into work who otherwise aren't able to work because of their, well, uh, their, their mental health condition. There are concerns that as more NHS resources are managed by GPs, access to talking therapies might actually become harder with inpatient beds more difficult to fund. But now this new approach does bring hope that individuals like Jessica no longer have to sit through their difficulties alone. Yao Chin, ITV News. Doctors looking for new ways of treating people after heart attacks think a breed of tropical fish may offer them new solutions. British scientists believe the tiny zebrafish may hold the key to new drugs to repair the damaged hearts of cardiac patients. Our medical editor Lawrence McGinty explains why. In the tropical fish world, they're pretty ordinary. So what is it about zebrafish that's got medical researchers so excited about helping, even curing people with heart failure? This is a normal, healthy heart beating away. But damage caused by a heart attack leaves the muscles feeble and unable to repair themselves. In a way, scientists want to go back to basics to answer questions like, why can't our hearts repair the damage that leads to heart failure naturally? And to do that, they'll be looking at these chaps, zebrafish, because their heart tissue can repair itself. And if scientists can find out why, they'll be well on the road to a treatment. Already, researchers in this laboratory have discovered there are cells in everyone's heart that can regrow into new heart muscle, just like the zebrafish. Trouble is, those cells are switched off. The key now is to find a way of turning them on. The intention with this program is to one day be able to actually regenerate completely normal heart muscle that would take over the, the function of the damaged heart muscle. And if we could achieve that, then that population of patients who currently have transplantation as their only option, uh, yes, they probably wouldn't need it. The secret of the zebrafish could, they hope, lead to new treatments for heart failure within five years. Lawrence McGinty, ITV News. Sport now and in last night's Premier League football, Arsenal strengthened their claim to second place in the table with a win over Everton. Wayne Rooney scored twice as Manchester United beat Aston Villa. Chelsea were without their costly new signings, but they still defeated Sunderland 4-2. And West Brom's clash with fellow strugglers Wigan ended in a draw. This is the ITV News at 5.30, our top story this morning. After eight days of nationwide protests, Egypt's President Mubarak has said he will stand down at next September's election. In a televised speech, he also said his son would not be a candidate to succeed him. But is that enough for the protesters who want him to go now? Our international correspondent John Irvine in Cairo has been finding out. They are a people who feel forgotten and ignored by their leader, but they know these last eight days and nights have got his attention and the expectation was palpable when he appeared on a makeshift TV screen in uprising central Tahrir Square. However, in the end, they were disappointed. It was a resignation in all but name, but a post-dated one, and therefore not enough. Sir, can I ask you for your reaction? People here are not gonna leave until he leaves. Um, he, he's taking steps, forward steps in, for more democracy. Uh, this is this is definitely good but at this point it will not do anything good to these people these people want him out so a post well, we are seeing right now the same scenario happened in tunisia right now he said the same speech ben ali said a few weeks ago people want him out he could just soft and silk just move the power to uh, to omar Suleiman and and everything's gonna be all right I don't want him, I don't trust him. This movement is only a few days old and yet they're incredibly impatient. But perhaps nobody should blame them after what they regard as 30 wasted years. So the uprising will continue and maintain its purity of purpose to bring about the 